Good evening and good morning to those of you not in Germany. So this is going to be a beginner level talk about observability and uh, Prometheus and some of the other tools that we also have available for this. So we're at Berlin Buzzword, so I figured I'd start off with a slightly unrelated topic, which is what is a buzzword? So a buzzword is a phrase that has become fashionable. Sometimes they lose their meaning because they became fashionable. So I don't think I know what set strategy means anymore, nor do I have any clue what synergy means. They've been put in so many places. People don't really know what they mean anymore when you say them. But the best buzzwords got to be fashionable because they, they're about something that's important. And that's kind of where the word observability has gotten to nowadays. That's not useful for beginners. So this topic is meant to build up some of that knowledge to help you understand why exactly this is a buzzword and uh, to start applying it the way uh, in ways that are actually useful to you. So first, you may be wondering who I am. I am a senior software engineering manager at Grafana Labs. My name is Merle Krantz. I've worked for 18 years as a C++ and Java programmer, as a software architect. Um, all of that time as an individual contributor. I'm also very active at the Apache Software Foundation. I've made contributions to the incubator, conferences, uh, to the community committee, to diversity. Uh, I'm also very active in and around financial management of the Apache Software Foundation and a little open source project called Apache Finract where I contributed to the microservices architecture. I got into software development because I think that software can make the world a better place. These are incredibly powerful tools and software developers are using them to solve or help solve some of the hardest, the most beautiful, the most ugly problems that humanity has. And I went to work for Grafana because I wanted to enable software developers to do this more effectively. Now, in today's systems, in today's worlds, there's there are a lot of different kinds of systems that people put together to try to understand uh, what's going on in, in their software systems. They look at databases, they try to apply tribal knowledge. Um, people do look at Prometheus, they, they look at logs. Um, but when you're dealing with a, a problem that just, just occurred and that needs to be solved quickly, this can be especially frustrating because it's so fragmented. This is going to be about uh, tools that help us to uh, solve this in a, in a slightly less fragmented, more holistic way. First, we actually need to understand what are we trying to solve? What is observability? We need to get uh, some definitions of some of these buzzwords in place. So monitoring versus observability. Well, monitoring is something that people do. Um, people go and they examine system behavior. People go and they look for explanations for that system behavior. They're looking at the system behavior because they're responding to an alert, or they're looking at the system behavior because they made a fix and they want to make sure it works. So they're, they're examining the, the response of the system now with these new conditions. In order to do that, um, people need to be enabled to do that via efficient uh, and relevant data collection. Um, they need to be able to store the data in a way that enables fast querying. They need alerting. Um, and But they need that not within simple systems because, I mean, monitoring a simple system is simple. You don't need a big system for that. Um, they need it within complex systems. But the, word, the meaning of some of these words has been diluted over time. Um, there's a fair bit of cargo culting going on. So um, the kernel of the, of the idea about observability is about changing the behavior. It's actually changing the companies in which, uh, in which these systems are applied. Monitoring is taken on in some, some places, is taken on just the meaning of collecting the data and not using it. So you've got like a data lake or a full text indexing. Um, and these are all cool technologies, but what are they for? Observability should be about enabling humans to understand complex systems. It's not just about finding out that something's broken, although that's pretty useful too. It's about digging in and understanding why it's broken and understanding that as quickly as possible. Now, I mentioned earlier that this isn't particularly useful for simple systems because simple systems can be understood without, uh, without extra tra-la-la. 
Um, this is about complex systems. And I'm not talking about uh, just any kind of complexity. There are kinds of complexity that can be uh, removed or reduced. For example, fixing a bad design or removing code that you don't need anymore. But some, some complexity is inherent. And you'll hear this a lot when you, when you hear teams talking about having moved something from a monolith to a microservices. And they're like, all we did is get different problems. Um, or the same problems, but in a different context. Well, that's because the system was complex and moving it from one place to another isn't gonna change that. That can, however, make it easier to com compartmentalize the complexity, um, to, to place boundaries around it so that uh, it can be understood in a smaller context. It should be possible to distill certain aspects of a complex system meaningfully um, in order to be able to observe it. And this brings us to the next question is, who is observing it? Well, the SREs are observing it, your site reliability engineers. Another buzzword, right? So what, uh, what is a site reliability, reliability engineer? Well, we mentioned earlier that any set or, well, we didn't, but uh, this, is, this is sort of what software is about. Any set of tasks um, or any task that's repeated often enough is a potential software problem. So um, Google does a lot of operations and because they do a lot of operations, it's a software problem. So how do they distill that software problem out? Well, one of the, one of the tools they use there and that, that have spread to the rest of the software world is something called SLIs, SLOs, and SLAs. Well, what is an SLI? SLI is a service level indicator. And that's a carefully defined quantitative, not qualitative, measure of some aspect of this, the level of service that is provided. So once you have a measure, once you have an indicator, then you can also set objectives, a target that you want that indicator to reach. And once you have a target, then you can also start to make agreements externally or internally saying that if we don't achieve this target, then we will pay a fine, take an action, whatever. Um, for a lot of organizations, a service level objective is as far as you need to go. Um, sometimes you need a service level agreement. You don't always need a service level agreement. In this context, um, SREs are trying to align incentives across the organization. And they're trying to do this across uh, four, four services. Um, each of which may have different owners, different teams, but have contracts that define their interfaces. Um, and they're doing this across uh, organizations that include developers, that include operational people, that include product managers. And each of these people may be focused on different aspects um, of the performance of their system. So what uh, putting out these common indicators does is it helps to align the incentives if you get the right indicators. And then once you have an indicator, you can get everybody looking kind of through the same window. They need a shared view so that they can all be seeing the same thing and reacting to the same information. So what actually should they be measuring? What actually should you be measuring in your services? Well, you need to be careful to pick something to measure that relates as directly as possible to what your users care about. So one good example is latency. Users care about the speed with which your website responds. Uh, it's also true though that measures affect each other. So um, for example, if you improve latency by making your website respond faster, you might do that by failing out um, more quickly if a service doesn't respond. So you could actually increase your error rate that might be an acceptable trade-off for you. It depends on what your business is. So what you need to be doing when you're defining your service level objectives is you need to avoid absolutes. So if you were to try to, example, for example, to set an error rate of 0% error rate, well, then you're probably going to end up paying a heavy price in other areas. If instead you can, can think more um, carefully about what your error rate is, then you can exchange a slight increase in the number of errors for something else that might also be important to you. So this is kind of what error budgets or other SLOs are about, is making it so that you can think uh, about all of these pieces together and the way they affect each other and achieve more than one objective. Uh, 
customers do care about their services being out. They don't care about the individual components. Um, and they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily concerned if the error, if there's an, once in a week, if there's an error. So once you have a measure, then you also have to ask yourself what to alert on in your services. Well, this one's both complex and simple at the same time. The simple of it is you only alert on things that are impacting your customer service, that are either now impacting your customer service or will be very soon. Don't alert on anything else because you're gonna wear people out and people will start ignoring your alerts. And here's another aside. Um, what is black box monitoring versus white box monitoring? Well, um, rather than escalate one of the, uh, elevate one of the other above the other, um, just consider that, that both have advantages, but we will be focusing more on white box monitoring in this talk. The white box monitoring looks more at the parts. So it, it actually looks into a component um, and captures out metrics or logs. Black box monitoring looks at it from the outside based on behavior or does it respond? Now, typically, uh, some aspects of black box monitoring are covered by white box monitoring. If you can get the metrics from a service, then it's at least responding to your request for metrics. So let's cover briefly what Prometheus does in this. Prometheus was inspired by Google's Borg Mom. It's a time series database um, that saves basically a time stat and a float64 value um, to a set of labels um, that allow you to locate it. So maybe you have a service and you have a whole bunch of instances of that service, you have it in a region, um, so you can query based on those labels. Now it's very common to uh, do dashboarding of Prometheus via Grafana. Um, Prometheus is not for event logging and we'll be covering event logging in just a little bit. So what is Prometheus saving? Well, Prometheus is persisting a time series um, that is a set of recorded values that change over time for each of the services or each of the components of the services that, that you're um, observing. Individual events can be merged into counters within the service um, or they can be uh, they can be captured or and aggregated um, outside of the service in Prometheus. There's typically uh, there's typically the counter, the gauge, and the histogram are are the ways in which data is typically saved. So a counter is something that continually rises. Um, you just add to a counter. Uh, you can derive rates from counters, for example, by saying it increased by this much in this amount of time. Uh, a gauge is something that can change over time. Um, the disadvantage to gauges is you might have a time time that you capture um, and there might be an event in between there that you miss. So let's say you have a temperature in a data center um, and it looks fairly cool, but if, you're, if, if the rate at which you're capturing it is slow enough, there might be a spike in between that you just didn't see. Nonetheless, gauges can, imp uh, can serve important purposes. Um, another, important case is histograms. So maybe you want to see uh, the, the data bucketed. Um, service latency is a really good example because um, some of your customers are going to see, a, a very small percentage of your customers are gonna see very slow response times and they're gonna remember it more than the customers who see your average response time. So just because it's a very small percentage of your customers does not mean that it's not important. And you can visualize all of this um, using Grafana, which is fun. Uh, and uh, because the querying uh, via prom PromQL, Prometheus QL is so flexible, uh, this makes it very, th this, uh, using this PromQL within uh, Grafana uh, makes it possible to do all kinds of interesting things with your data after it's been captured. So what are the main selling points of, of Prometheus? Well, one, it's highly dynamic. So you have built-in service discovery which means that uh, you can add components into your, uh, into your architecture, into your landscape, without uh, having to manually register them with your Prometheus server. It, it uh, automatically gets added via the same service discovery mechanism that you use also for, your, for, for, for answering customer requests. There's no hierarchical model, so it's just n-dimensional label set. Um, 
again, uh, I mentioned PromQL just a second ago. You can use PromQL for processing. You can use it for graphing. You can use it for alerting. And you can, you can use it for, for exporting. So you're using the same query language for, for everything. Um, and it's very simple to operate. Uh, you basically just start it up. Uh, it's also really fast. It's a part of the reason it's really fast is because it's a pool-based system. Um, it's not event-based, and it's primarily white box monitoring. However, there is a black box monitoring aspect, which is basically if it hits your metrics endpoint, request you know polls, uh, your your metrics endpoint, uh, and you don't get a response, then that's a simple form of black box monitoring. In addition, Prometheus makes hard API commitments within major versions, so it remains uh, compatible within major versions. So here's some examples, some simple, uh, simple examples of, uh, of, of, the, um, of the measures that you can capture. So if you can look, for example, at HTTP, HTTP requests, uh, and then you can look at different environments, production or test environment. You can look at different methods, post or get. You can look at it by code, and then you can see the number uh, of requests within each of these categories. So uh, is it scalable? Well, Kubernetes is the Borg. Prometheus is basically Borgbon within this context. And Google couldn't have run the Borg that is uh, their Kubernetes clusters without Borgmon. Kubernetes and Prometheus are designed and written with each other in mind. Uh, they absolutely, if, if Google can run them at scale, then you probably can too. One Prometheus instance um, has been seen to have as many as 125 million active time series at once. So it can take on a lot of data. Now, Prometheus is less optimized for long-term data storage. So there are a couple of projects working to sort of pick up the back end of that. You can connect Prometheus with Thanos, um, which is historically easy, uh, easier to run, but slower. Um, and it scales storage horizontally. Cortex, which is catching up on uh, how easy it is to run. Um, you can scale storage, you can scale the ingester, and you can scale the query uh, horizontally as well. So that's just metrics, but observability typically has three pillars. That is metrics, logs, and traces. So let's think about logs. Let's move on to Loki. Loki is an open source project under the AGPL license at uh, Grafana Labs, which follows the same label-based system as Prometheus. So you can query your logs um, on any of the same metrics that you're that you're querying them on in, in Prometheus, especially if they're if you're putting them into the same system, if it comes from the same uh, from the same service, then it will have the same labels. This makes the information cross-referenceable, which can be very very useful in the middle of an incident. So let's say you see a spike, and now you want to look for all of the logs within the time frame around that spike. You can do that by using the same query that you use to look at, at the spike. It's also very efficient because it is not creating a full text index. It's only indexing on the timestamp and on the label. This means that you can work with logs at scale without having a huge cost of a very large index. You can turn the logs into metrics too uh, to make it easier to work with them. I'll show you an example, just a screenshot of an example in a little bit. Um, and because you're pulling the data out of the system basically via prompt tail, uh, it's very simple to set up. So this is an example of uh, pulling metrics out of your logs. Uh, if you look closely at the query, you'll see that it's querying for the errors. So you can actually look at the number of log messages uh, that contain an error over time. And then you'll see, uh, you'll see a progression. You'll see the, the, the tendencies and, and uh, the changes over time. Let's take a closer look what I was mentioning before about what a log, log entry looks, at, looks like. Remember I said you have indexed data and unindexed data. And part of the key, part of the trick here is that you're not indexing all of it. You're only indexing the timestamp and the specific labels, the Prometheus style labels. Uh, you're not indexing the rest of the log line, which 
does not mean you cannot search on the rest of the log line. You can. Uh, what that means is in order to scale out search, what Loki does is um, first you search on the labels um, and you return those parts of logs and then it just does a full text search um, massively parallelized across the rest of that. So that gets us logs. Remember I said we have three pillars of observability. We have metrics, we have logs and we have traces. And for traces, there's another, this is the newest child of, of Grafana Labs, also an open source project, also AGPL licensed. Tempo is uh, there for traces. So um, this includes, this is an object store only. Um, it's 100% compatible with uh, open telemetry tracing. It's not a uh, sampling. This is all of your traces that are getting uh, stored. However, it is exemplar based. For those of you who don't know what exemplar means, uh, exemplar is basically like uh, if you have a progression of data, um, but you have too much data to, to save all of it, you can save uh, individual points over time and then uh, go to those samples. If, some, if, you, if your data shows that there's a problem, you can pick out one of the examples that was saved from that time. So that's what an exemplar is. This is exemplar based, but again, it's not sampling because 100% of your traces are saved. It also, uh, because it, it's based on the same uh, label set, you can move easily from, uh, from Prometheus to Loki to Tempo and back again. So bringing that together, you can move, I, I mentioned it just now, you can move from your logs to your traces, you can move from your metrics to your traces, you can move from your traces to your logs, any which way you wanna go, you can go with this because it all uh, lives sort of within the same query language. And because this is all open source, you can also run it yourself. So, I mean, I'm out here, of course, I work for Grafana Labs. I would love if you pay us uh, to run it and we would be happy to run it for you. Um, for small installations, we'll even run it for you for free, for free forever. Um, you get a 14 day Grafana Cloud uh, Pro trial. And then after that you have uh, limitations on the, the number of active series. But again, you can run it for free with us in our cloud. Um, <clears throat> and if you're, uh, if, if you're interested in setting up the stack, as I said, it's open source. If there's something that you want to change, you can look at it. You can figure out little improvements that you want to make or big improvements. This is one of the, the advantages of open source. So with that, let me say thank you. And are there any questions? Thanks for the talk. I think it's a great uh, introduction to all things monitoring. I haven't seen any questions. I guess if there's not a question, I'm curious, uh, at Grafana Labs, um, do you all provide like the uh, solution for all three like metrics, logs, and traces, or just for metrics? Uh, like traditionally, I've thought of Grafana as Grafana Labs, but I guess I'm learning something as well. <laughs> yes, we offer hosted Prometheus. Um, we offer uh, hosted Loki, and we offer hosted Tempo, which is traces. And of course, we have a beautiful UI that we can put on top of all of that, so you can access all of that via our UI. Got it. Sounds good. All right. I guess uh, maybe. Uh, oh, there's a question that just came in. Uh, uh, let me read it out to you. Um, the sam the like the fact that we don't have sampling concerns. Uh, somebody like in terms of cost. Uh, so. Is there sampling, I guess? I guess the question comes down to like, do you all provide sampling? If not, like the costs could get expensive? Uh, it is possible to uh, do sampling, but we charge by the series um, rather than, uh, well, I mean, there are, there are gigabyte limits on some of the services, but most of the services we provide by the number of series that you're, that you're persisting. Um, so if you're using the free tier, you're not gonna get charged anyways. You don't even have to put in your credit card. So you're not gonna get accidentally charged like Amazon does sometimes. Um, so if you're concerned about that, then try it out and see what happens. Uh, experiment with it uh, under the free tier. Uh, I guess 
the second question coming in is would you recommend this for small setups or is there a minimum size making it worthwhile uh, well, there are some small setups you might even want to do it on i've seen uh, some really interesting write-ups where people uh, monitored an aquarium with prometheus now you probably don't need log files for that one you probably don't need traces for that one either uh, but I think Prometheus, at very least, uh, it's it's easy to set up Prometheus, and it's fun too. Um, and Grafana also is very easy. So just putting that on top of Prometheus, you can look at the data. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's not the problem I was talking about in my talk here. But uh, I certainly I really think that Prometheus is easy enough to use that you can even use it for small problems. And then. I guess there's one more question that just came in. It says, I'm new to Prometheus. Are there any clients out there that play well with Prometheus other than Grafana? So Prometheus does come with a kind of a, a very simple uh, default web interface. Um, there, yeah, but uh, I think really Grafana is the best thing out there for it. Up, up until very recently, uh, Prometheus was actually delivering Grafana with their releases. Um, so the Prometheus team also uh, clearly sees Grafana as the best way to, to examine their data.